Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. We are going to give it a couple of moments to let everyone trickle in, but we really appreciate you taking the time to join this panel today. Um, and we're really excited to share some alumni insights with you. So we'll give it another moment and then we will get started. Okay, hello everyone again. Thank you for taking the time to join us. My name is Caitlin Carpio and I am the Alumni Engagement Officer for the Critical Language Scholarship Program. I am also a really proud CLS Chinese alumna and CLS actually allowed me to travel overseas for the very first time after my sophomore year of college. I also went on to live in Taiwan for three years as a Fulbright English teaching assistant. So CLS really, broadened my horizons, opened a lot of doors for me, and I'm really appreciative of my experience. The CLS program is a program of the U.S. Department of State with funding provided by the U.S. government and supported in its implementation by us here at American Councils for International Education. The CLS program is an opportunity to intensively study a critical language and the culture of the region where it is spoken over the summer. It supports U.S. students in all fields of study and at all degree levels to learn what the U.S. Department of State refers to as critical languages. These are languages that are especially important to America's engagement with the rest of the world. We're extremely excited because the application for our summer 2024 program is open right now and will be until Tuesday, November 14th at 8 p.m. Eastern time or 5 p.m. Pacific time. We will put a link in our chat box now so you can learn more if you don't know a lot about the program yet or are interested in starting an application. I'm also very excited to be joined by one of my colleagues and then also um, an alumna of the program today. So first, I want to turn it over to my colleague, Jay Rich, who is the program officer for Persian and Russian. Thanks, Caitlin. Um, so as Caitlin mentioned, I am the program officer for Persian and Russian with the CLS program here at American Councils for International Education. Um, a little bit of my background as well, like Caitlin, I am also an alum of the CLS program. I traveled to Tajikistan with CLS Persian in 2013, um, which was really one of my first introductions to intensively studying a language abroad. I had previously studied abroad in Germany in high school, so I've been fortunate to have uh, several different uh, experiences as a language student living abroad. Um, I'm also really excited to to point out that we're being that we're uh, joined here by two other CLS participants who have generously volunteered their time to share their experiences abroad. Part of the CLS program's mission is to break down barriers that stand in the way of equitable representation in study abroad and provide support to all students to meet their goals. So we wanted to hear directly from the experiences of previous participants to talk about the challenges of study abroad from different student perspectives but also about what life was like for them on the program. So what perspectives they brought with them to study abroad and what perspectives they gained through participation in study abroad. As study abroad program administrators, we know that sometimes students interested in applying to the CLS program have questions about how to articulate the connection between their target language and their field of study especially those who come from fields that have traditionally not incorporated language-focused study abroad. However, we know that the study of critical languages is important for students and professionals of all fields, and that students with a wide variety of majors derive extraordinary value from the connections that they build and the experiences that they have on the CLS program. 
So today I want to get things started by allowing our panelists to introduce themselves. So if each of you could take a few minutes to share a little bit about yourself, why you wanted to participate in today's session and your CLS language year, the university you attended, things like that. So we will start first with you, May. Thank you so much, Caitlin. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Yume, and I did Indonesian in 2022. I graduated this spring from Tufts University with a degree in international relations, and I'm currently in D.C. Uh, working in Southeast Asian studies um, in a security think tank, but I will be moving into uh, a international development role later this year. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to hear you guys uh, talk or ask questions and things like that. Um, and then we can go into questions later if needed. Amazing. Thank you, Yume, for being here. And now I want to pass it over to Derek. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Derek Farange. Um, I did CLS Hindi in the summer of 2022 um, in Jaipur, India. Um, I studied global studies at St. Lawrence University, which is in a small liberal arts school in upstate New York. Um, and currently I'm doing a Fulbright um, to pursue my master's degree in international relations at um, IE University in Madrid. Great, thank you so much, Derek and Yume for introducing yourselves. So we have some prepared questions that we would like to ask our panelists today, but if any attendees have questions you'd like to ask our panelists, feel free to use the Q&A function and we'll try to get to those as well. Our initial questions for our panelists are, what was your motivation for applying to the CLS program and how did you get interested in your CLS language? So I guess we'll start with you, May, again. Great. Um, thank you. So I uh, am Southeast Asian, so I got interested in studying Indonesian uh, because it's not necessarily a language that's really has or th that there there's a lot of opportunity to study in as a college student in the States. Um, the year I applied, I think someone said that uh, less than 300 students across the U.S. was able to were able to study it in like a uh, like a formal setting, so that was like a big motivation for me. Um, and also because I was doing international studies, and my area of interest is um, the kind of the intersection between East and Southeast Asia. I really wanted to uh, learn Indonesian because I already speak Mandarin, and because I felt that it really would sort of add to my ability to kind of just connect with people and just chat like on a colloquial level about their experiences. And yeah, so, so those are like my primary uh, reasons for applying. Should I go? <laughs> um, okay, so. Um, yeah, at one point, I was very interested in um, agricultural development. And during my first year of undergrad, I went to um, India to do a research fellowship um, at an agricultural development nonprofit. Um, and I was going to small villages in um, northern India and interviewing people. Um, and obviously, I realized that not knowing Hindi was a big barrier to that. Um, and even though I had a translator, there was a lot of things that I was um, missing. And yeah, you don't really think about necessarily that part when you're conducting research, but like that's definitely like part of it. You're missing a lot of the cultural like nuances if you don't know the language. Um, and I also, from that experience, realized a lot of the problems with um, the current agricultural development framework um the way we pursue agricultural development um and i got really interested in the concept of food sovereignty um and so i went back to my university after that summer um and i re also realized that india was kind of at the forefront of doing work in in food sovereignty um and my school didn't have a hindi program um so i thought cls was a great way to pursue hindi and be able to go back to india eventually and do research on food sovereignty. Amazing. Thank you so much for both of you for sharing. I think it's really interesting how you found the intersection of um, something that 
um, a, an area of research um, at school that you were interested in, and then also a language that you would be able to tie that into and be able to continue with that research later. I'm also interested because Jay is also an alum. So I am curious, Jay, kind of what got you interested in your CLS target language and why did you ultimately apply for CLS as well? Yeah, sure. Um, so when I was in college, I had already studied German for several years and was pursuing a degree in linguistics and knew that I needed another language, uh, you know, just for myself. I would always wanted to, to study more languages. Um, I sort of ended up with Persian by happenstance. Um, I knew people in the Persian department and one thing led to another and I had signed up for the Persian 101 class and during my first semester of taking Persian I was really enjoying the classes and I signed up for the CLS program and it was after my very first year of studying Persian that I went abroad to Tajikistan and continue studying Persian there. Uh, so really it was CLS that that uh, changed my life and, and drew me into Persian more than anything else ever did. So it was actually the CLS experience that that drew me into my target language. So as as an alum as well. Caitlin, what drew you into your target language? Thanks for asking. Um, so for me, I went to UNC Chapel Hill. I was already taking Mandarin courses um, at UNC and I was very interested in Mandarin and also East Asia. And I was a international relations major. So I um, was also curious about um, learning the language more so that I could apply it to the IR sphere. Um, but I was also really interested in being able to use my language skills in a more meaningful way to be able to create new relationships. So I had really just been studying in the classroom and I was really eager to be able to apply those language skills um, outside the classroom. I wasn't really able to find a lot of opportunities to use my Mandarin every day. And so I was really eager to go abroad if I could. And again, I had never been overseas beforehand. So when I saw CLS, I thought this is an incredible opportunity. Um, a lot of people did think that is a big jump to go from never being overseas to doing this immersive, um, very intense program. But that was kind of the way that I wanted to go about. I really wanted to just jump in fully and be able to use uh, my Mandarin skills to build relationships. And I really did get to, I had a host family and they had a 12 year old daughter um, and we became the best of friends. And um, I was able to use my Chinese for the first time to really meet people that I wouldn't have been able to um, beforehand. And I got very close to my language partners. I still talk to them today. Um, and yeah, it really opened the door to overseas travel for me um, and, and wanting to use Chinese to build relationships in the future. So um, yeah, really a really um, formative experience for me. So now I want to ask um, our panelists a little bit about uh, any concerns that you might have had when you were applying or before you participated in the CLS program? For instance, for me, right, it was my first overseas experience. So I remember the day before the flight, I was very scared about the flight itself. I actually wasn't that scared about living with a host family or this intensive program. I was scared about like a, a, an 11 hour flight because I just had never been on a on a plane that long. Um, but, you know, I, I overcame that challenge. I was on the flight and realized, oh, actually, it's not too bad uh, if I use different strategies, watch movies. Uh, and now I'm very glad that I got on that flight because it has opened a lot of different opportunities for me since then. So just wondering, yeah, what were kind of some of the concerns that stood out to you? Um, before the program? And then what were some resources or maybe individuals or support mechanisms that you were able to draw on um, to prepare for the program? So this time, let's start with Derek. Um, yeah, I guess one of the things I was most concerned about, um, I, so I'm a first generation college student. So like I would work during the summers to like provide for myself. Um, during the year and even though like CLS is fully funded I was kind of nervous about navigating my life after not having like summer income and also like being able to like do things in in India like for fun and like having money for that um, and I'm in like a luckily I like was in a program like for first generation college students so I would use them as like a resource to kind of um, prepare for that and see like what kind of 
things there were that my school um, could give me to like support the fact that I was um, like missing a summer income. Um, so yeah, anyone else is in that situation, I would definitely recommend like reaching out to your university because there's all kinds of things you don't know about sometimes unless you ask. Um, yeah, and I mean, I went in during a special time. It was like the tail end of COVID. So obviously I was very um, nervous about that. Um, and we didn't actually stay with a homestay family. But if I had been staying with a homestay family, I think that's something I would have been, um, you know, a little bit nervous about kind of navigating living with people you don't know, people who have um, different cultural norms from yours, people who don't, um, or are not going to speak the same language as you. Maybe they do speak the same language as you, but they're not going to speak it with you. Um, and yeah, I guess I didn't have to navigate that. So I didn't really reach out to anyone to get resources for it. But um, yeah, maybe there's some other perspectives on that. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I had never been in Indonesia before, and I was also starting a language from, I think, the like the most beginning level, um, because Indonesian didn't require any prerequisites. Um, and I've been really lucky to be able to study abroad and also travel abroad to visit family in the past. Uh, so I think I definitely sort of drew upon those experiences because I kind of knew sort of what to expect in terms of certain cultural norms in the region but I definitely um wasn't sure what it'd be like in like a completely new setting in like a cohort setting and also just sort of it's a very intense program like um like you're up for you know like the entire day like doing activities so I wasn't really sure like how I was going to handle that um uh, like Derek said it was also the tail end of COVID so like I didn't really know um what to expect because there wasn't like the host family and a lot of things were different but um I think a big thing I ended up uh leaning on a big or a big source of like support for me was obviously like my cohort um because we were all staying together um and not with host families I we like all became very close very quickly because we spent basically the whole day together um so I think that really help validate some of the experiences so we could sort of talk through like anything that was making us anxious or just debrief about our days um and that was very helpful or just like sit around and do homework together so yeah great thank you both yeah I think that a lot of the resources that we can draw on from our universities from the people around us from people that have been to the region before that we can draw on are are really great ways to sort of get yourself prepared for for this um, aspect of going abroad um, another really important thing is the fact that every individual who is, you know, going to go abroad and have a different experience um, brings their own set of identities and perspectives into their experience. So my question now is, how did aspects of your identity shape your CLS experience? And I guess we can uh, start with you, May, again. Yeah, sure. Um like I previously mentioned, I like my mom is Southeast Asian. So I really did feel like it did shape a lot of my experience. Um, and also just being just Asian American in general, studying abroad in Asia. Um, because I think in some countries, like the perception is still like that Americans like are a certain way. And I think the yeah, concept at least the way Americans go about the concept of like hyphenated identities isn't necessarily always like easily translatable or easily understood. Um, so I think that while it was like very challenging for me, like multiple times I had like, you know, some, a random storekeeper asked me like, oh, like, are you sure you're not like Japanese? And I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm not Japanese. Thanks. Um, or things like that. Um, and like kind of explained that I was like an American, even though I was like, I had parents from the region and things like that. Um, while it, like it can be tiring, um, it is also like part of the whole like citizen diplomacy thing where you are like really just trying to show that like being an American can look very different to a lot of different people. And that doesn't take away from like 
your American identity or your Asian identity or whatever other like identities that you hold. Um, but I will say like, it does get, it did get like very tiring. Um, and I was, I think not necessarily prepared for that uh, when I first went. Um, but I, again, like I like really like drew on support from like my teachers as well, who like sort of helped me articulate like in Indonesian, my background in a way that I found comfortable um, to people who like asked. Um, so I would say the biggest part of my identity that like shaped my CLS experience, um, is the fact that I'm queer and I remember the first time that I went to India it was like less than a year after they, after they, um, decriminalized like same sex relationships. And I kind of like isolated myself because of that. And I had all these preconceived notions that I didn't get out upside of my bubble and like break um so I you know I had that like fear again and I and I promised myself that I wasn't going to do that I had traveled a lot more um after that like first time that I went to India um so I was you know kind of a little more experienced with um navigating the yeah the issues that come with traveling as a queer person being in a different country as a queer person um and yeah, it completely um, shaped my experience. I had to navigate so many things like, do I tell my um, language partner um, that I'm gay? Do, do I tell my teachers? Like it was, yeah, a, a difficult experience um, to navigate, but um, maybe it's another question I can go more into that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you both for sharing some of the the real, you know, challenges and feelings that you had during the program. I think that does lead in well, um, Derek, into the next question, which were, you know, what were some of the strategies that you used to maybe address or overcome some of these challenges or, um, you know, when you were in some of these situations or were there different strategies that you used to manage stress when you were abroad? Um, I know you may, you talked about leaning on your cohort members and your teachers a lot. Were there any kind of strategies, you know, hobbies that you continued that you enjoy in the U.S. that you brought overseas or um, just kind of, you know, different strategies that, that you found effective and helpful? Derek, we can start with you. Yeah, I would say definitely the biggest one was like my cohort. Um, I from my from what I saw, like CLS does a really good job of like getting a diverse cohort um, for the programs. Um, and you know, my program was like that as well. And you know, so we were all going through. We might have had like different reasons that we were struggling or different you know identities that we had to um navigate but we were all like going through similar things um and there was also other lgbtq people like on my program um so it was really helpful to like talk to them like oh like what are you like doing with your language partner um like how, like how are you like addressing the teachers um yeah so really like leaning um, on the cohort was really helpful. Um, yeah, and I mean, I think it be it became really helpful to like meet people um, who like are actually from the place and ask them like what their perspectives are. Um, so yeah, I like I it helped the most like talking to Indians and being like, what would happen if I told my professor this? Like, what do you think their like perspective would be? Or like, should I come out to like my language partner? Um, and that like proved really helpful. Um, and it, I mean, it's a very like personal um, journey, but like, I feel like, for example, with my language partner, I didn't have my, or my relationship completely changed with them. Like once I came out, like everything felt different and like more open um, and like we could actually like be friends, um, which I didn't necessarily realize that wasn't happening before until I actually did like come out to them. Um, so yeah, those are all things like you have to navigate. And I think that like leaning on your cohort could be like really helpful because there's going to be people from all parts of the U.S., all different backgrounds and identities. Um, and they can give you, it's good. It's one good, just, just to have people to talk to. Um, and two, they're going to have some of their own like perspectives that they can give you. Yeah. I mean, I think 
I like largely agree about like leaning on your cohort members. Um, and I do feel like it did like the same challenges did open a lot of conversations, even down to like the very basic, like with my language partners, like, oh, like, what kind of food do you eat at home? And then I was like, oh, I actually don't eat something totally different than what you guys eat every day. Um, and things like that. And I think that was really fun. And I think, um, but yeah, I think a big part of it was my roommate. She was Indonesian American. Um, so she had sort of very similar struggles um, because she, you know, was very much plugged into the region. Um, but uh, people obviously like held her to like higher standards because like her like mom was Indonesian and things like that. So I think us like being able to sit down and sort of like talk through um, these parts of identity not necessarily like in a, oh, we're going to sit down and talk about our identities now sort of way, but just kind of just spending time together. And as it came up to uh, like, just chat about it, I think was um, really helpful. And I think there was also, it wasn't like all bad either. Um, I think uh, one of our other like very close members of our cohort, uh, she um, is Muslim American and she was thrilled to have sort of like accommodations like now like basically built in for her and her like her faith um so I think that for her that was like really really wonderful and like uh, like another way and it sort of is part of that just like cult cross-cultural experience but yeah I would just like kind of put it down to like your cohort members are basically like like they're your people during like this two like this eight to ten week thing um and they really do like shape your experience a lot. Um, so yeah, that's what I would mostly say. And I also try to call friends from home every so often, um, or at least send them pictures or keep them updated. So that I think helped keep me grounded. So I could, and it could sort of like journaling, but like not really, because um, even if it's just like a picture on my Instagram story, um, I think it was really helpful because I'd be like, oh, like, here's the thing I did today. And then like some of my friends would reply and be like, wow, that's like really cool. Like, can you tell me a little bit about X, Y, Z? And I think it did help me sort of like process and like break down my days. Um, so definitely like stay connected and plugged into your um, friends and family back home as well. Yeah, those are great strategies that you both shared. Um, I know in terms of cohorts, um, I also did want to just bring up that we also have a lot of alumni resources. So like you may, Derek, they actually helped to run affinity groups as alumni ambassadors this past year for finalists before they went off for the summer. And so um, we offered um, several different affinity groups and this was a way for um, finalists to be able to connect with other peers that had similar identities um, and just talk through any concerns or any questions or just to kind of find support before the summer. And so that is an avenue that is open to students who do get accepted. Um, we also have a really helpful resource called the Alumni Resource Directory every year. And so alumni of all years, all languages, all different backgrounds will volunteer to be listed in this directory. And it's shared with all uh, finalists and you can filter and see, you know, individuals that maybe come from the same school, have the same major as you, have some of the same identity markers, and you can reach out to, the, to that particular alumni, talk a little bit more about um, your concerns or questions, and they're really open to, uh, to speaking about their experiences, sharing any tips. Um, so we do have a lot of alumni support um, and pathways available before the summer as well. And then, of course, you do have your cohort during the summer as well. So I uh, did want to let you know about those mechanisms, um, and I'll pass it over to Jay now. Thanks, Caitlin. And thanks, Yuma and Derek, for sharing some of those uh, perspectives on, on how you dealt with stress. Um, so another question that I have for you guys is, I'd, I'd like to just hear a little bit more about what your experiences were like. Can you tell me about a memorable experience from your time on the CLS program? And we'll start with Derek again. Um. I remember one of my most memorable experiences is I was with, was with my language partner um, and some friends and um, we just like, they put on like 
uh, Bollywood um, music. And I remember that we were like, they were just like all teaching me like Bollywood dances. And we were all like dancing around like in a circle. And I just like felt so like part, I don't know, of like a, a community or like it felt really nice to have like a group of friends, none of whom were like part of my like cohort. Like it felt like I was really like becoming part of the place. Um, and yeah, so just like creating those like relationships and friendships was, um, I think probably the most memorable experience for me. And there are people like that I still um, keep in contact with and ask like how they're doing. And yeah, it's, I think that was one of the most memorable things for me is making those connections. I think for me, like two of the like most memorable things and also kind of like helpful ways that I kind of transitioned from being in the, the States into Indonesia um, was that I, there were a lot of cats in Indonesia, like there's cats everywhere and I really like cats and it was very easy to express that I liked cats with not very many words, um, <laughs> mostly because I would go and I just, I would go around and like just take pictures of the cats because they're really cute. Um, so I think that was very easy to sort of like open up to uh, like the staff and the program administrators there because um, a couple of them had just like cat food lying around. So they gave me some cat food and I think that was an easy way to connect. And um, that didn't necessarily require like too much language ability, especially like at the beginning when I was like much more nervous about um, sort of picking up the language and things like that. And I think the second um, sort of thing is was playing Uno. Um, because the rules of Uno are universal. Um, it's like once that plus four like comes down, like you 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 all know what that means. Like, um, so I think those like very sort of simple moments, I think did make me feel really connected because um while this is like obviously like a language program and so much emphasis is put on um like picking up your language, it's like very fair to be very scared like it's like okay um especially like if you're like me I like didn't really have a whole lot of background in the language um going in um so sort of like picking up on those like daily joys I think was something that I really enjoyed um and that were that were really meaningful to me even though they were like very small yeah, I love that you both shared those examples. I had a very similar experience you made where I, I taught the 12 year old um, host sibling Uno as well. And then suddenly we were playing it at restaurants, in the car, um, whenever we we would go to excursion, she was teaching her friends. Um, and then we were starting to play it in Chinese, um, which was also very cool because, you know, we could say the colors, the numbers. Um, so it ended up being, I think, a, a helpful language tool as well. Um, and I remember for my experience, um, we would like have hula hoop competitions in the house. We'd go on walks at night, my host sibling and I, um, and and talk through, you know, our favorite movies and just like every day, you know, getting to know the people that um, I was in the community with was really special and going to like the same bakery every day. And, and by the end of eight weeks being like, oh, I really um, have met so many individuals I wouldn't have been able to without um, this experience and without um, getting out of my shell a little bit and, and using my language skills. So um, totally agree about the relationships being such an impactful part of the summer. Um, I do want to ask, now that you both have had some time to reflect on your CLS experiences, um, if there's anything that you wish you would have known before you participated in CLS, now looking back, um, if there was certain aspects of the program or, um, you know, the specific cultures that you were in that now looking back, you, you know, that could have been helpful information to have known. And we can start with uh, you, May. Um, I think overall, I think the briefing that I was given sort of at the beginning um, was pretty like pretty like standard and pretty I think pretty helpful as like a baseline um but I do think a lot of CLS is sort of what you make of it um and I think uh something I really struggled with was sort of wanting to get sort of like every single moment out of 
uh, the day or the program, but also being so tired. Um, so I think definitely, uh, like just re, I like would just reemphasize that if you do participate in the program, like be prepared to like sort of have to kind of make those like cost benefit calculations for yourself, like, and sort of if you need to take time for yourself and not spend, you know, five hours like playing games outside your school, um, then that's okay. Like sometimes you just need a break. Um, and like it's okay to like set those sort of sort of like guidelines for yourself. Um. But I think I was definitely like, I've never participated in a program like CLS and I probably won't again. Um, but it was so, but I think that sort of knowing and understanding that balance a bit more was would, would have been, I think, um, a lot more beneficial for myself at least. Um, I think I wish I would have known like kind of as I was talking about before, like how diverse like the cohort was going to be. Um, like one of the things I was most nervous about nervous about is like I'm gonna be the only like queer person on the program. I'm gonna have no one to talk to and like no support. Um and like that was not the case at all, it was quite the opposite. Um I mean I'm not I can't say that every cohort is going to be like that, but that's like something um that I kind of wish I knew it would have like calmed a lot of my like stress before going. Um and I guess another thing is how like kind um, people would be and like how open they would be to like learning about me and who I am. Um, yeah, I, I I think there could be a tendency like to get there and kind of like isolate yourself and like not want to get out and like, like just chat with people. Um, but I think in most places, like people like want to know you, know who you are um, and are pretty like accepting in general um of course there's like caveats to that but um yeah those are two things I wish I had known I think one thing I would sort of add on to what Derek said is and this is not necessarily related about like oh something that I wish I would know him, but I do think that um and like cohorts are really amazing people to rely on but then also I found myself like learning way more about America than I have literally ever learned in my life um, cause I know Southeast Asia and I know like Indonesian culture, like a little bit, but do you know, I don't know anything about Kentucky, like, and I have people, like people in my cohort from like Kentucky or, um, uh, or like other parts of the country that I had never been to. And I think like sort of taking the time to just learn from each other in that way as well. Cause it's like, I think even though like this is a study abroad program, um, you, it is easy to sort of like forget, like how diverse we are like within America as well and I felt like I really learned a lot um from my cohort members who were like from all over the country and had all sorts of experiences as well um and yeah thank you both so much for for those different perspectives on on sort of uh what your expectations were and how CLS sort of changed or or gave you new insights into your experiences abroad so looking back on, you know, around this time of year, just a couple of years ago, um, when you were filling out your application, what advice or tips might you share with those who are watching and want to prepare a competitive application for the CLS program? And we can start with you, May, again. Uh, I think a big one is... Um... I would em emphasize that like I applied to CLS a total of four times um, and like it is okay if you don't get it the first time like that does not mean you should stop from reapplying um, because it is still very worth it. Um, I think that's one thing I would note so it's like especially if you're like not a senior in college like not saying that you shouldn't put you know your best effort into your essays and things like that but um, know that like as you gain more experience throughout college, that will make your essays better. Um, and the act of writing your essays yourself itself, like will like force you to sort of like figure out what it is that you want to do with like the language that you're uh, pursuing. Um, I think that's like one aspect of it. And then in terms of just like the writing aspect, I think I leaned really heavily on my scholarship advisor at my school um, and also the writing center tutors um, to sort of set, uh, deadlines for myself and also just get a second eye and I just really did um 
and it's very trite, but really do try to be yourself. And I think the thing that I struggled with most with, and like Kayla mentioned, most people struggle with is like articulating the link between your language and your interests. Um, so just make sure that's like just very, very clear in your essays. Um, even if you think it's obvious, like if like I would just write it out in like a sentence straight up, be like, this is my connection and this is how I like want to do it. Because, um, and for all scholarship essays, pretty much, it, it needs to be easy to read. Um, so um, those are some of my like tips off the top of my head. Um, yeah, one of my biggest tips would be like any like read or send your essays to like anyone who will listen to you um, because like you're not going to be the person who's reading your application, somebody else is. So it's good to get other people's perspectives. Um, and I also applied to CLS more than once. I only applied twice, but the first time I didn't get in and um, like that, I go, I went to a small liberal arts school. So like we didn't have like a scholarship advisor or like anything like that. And I'm sure there's, you know, other plenty of other students who don't have those things either. Um, and I was kind of intimidated by that the first time um, that I had applied and I didn't, you know, reach out to anyone, ask them to read my essays or anything like that. Um, and then the second time, like so many people have read my essays and they all had different things to say that I, you know, some things I said, oh, well, like, I really like this. I'm not going to change it. But most things I was like, yeah, that like would sound better. And every single person had a different thing to say that someone else missed. Um, so yeah, that I think that's really like the biggest thing you can do. And obviously also, yeah, be yourself, um, but be the best version of yourself um, is really important. Um, and also other people can, can help you with that. Sometimes you like, you know yourself really well, but sometimes you even miss things about yourself that someone else can be like, oh, well, like, what about this? You didn't, you know, really talk about like that. I think that's something somebody would really like to know because you don't always think about the things about yourself that other people, um, would be interested in. And I guess since this is about identity, like your identity is like really important. Um, like, don't be afraid to share things about it um, in your application. I think sometimes people like shy away from talking about their identity. Um, I did that like early on in my academic career, but um, your everyone's identity is really important to who they are and like what they can contribute to the program. So like, don't be afraid to talk about it. Yeah, those are wonderful tips. Thank you so much to both of you for sharing. I just want to echo both of your points that um, you should really reach out to professors, trusted resources, even peers to look over your essays. Um, I think you want to be really specific with examples that you share and um, having a second or third look. Those individuals can um, help you know if you're kind of getting across and articulating, you know, the, the skill sets that you are trying to showcase. Um, I did want to note that on our website, you can look and we have a search function where you can see if there are any registered CLS advisors on your campus. But if there is not a registered CLS advisor, we have a lot of resources on our website um, for all applicants to help you prepare a compelling application, regardless of the level of support that you have on your campus. So we have an application tips video that we really encourage you to uh, take a look at. It walks through each of the essay questions in detail to explain how you might be able to approach that question based on your experiences. We also have our selection criteria made public on our website, so you can look and see exactly what our reviewers are looking for in your application. Um, and we have a lot of different webinars that we've been hosting throughout the month of October. So if you go to our events page, you can see um, all of the recordings um, from previous webinars. And so if there's a specific CLS language, um, Persian, you know, um, uh, Chinese, any of these languages, Japanese, Indonesian, um, Hindi, um, you can look and find the, the language specific webinar that we have hosted previously and you can learn more about that specific program. We also have a virtual offering called CLS Spark. So if you are interested in um, Arabic, Mandarin or Russian at the beginning level and you are an undergrad student, um, that could be a really good fit for you. And so you can check out our Spark overview 
um, we have a whole video um, about the application process and the program structure. So um, we have a host of resources we really want um, to let you know about, hope you can take advantage of um, and learn more about our programs. Um, so again, please visit our website, um, our YouTube channel, um, and also our social media it does also highlight a lot of alumni stories as well. Um, there's a question in the Q&A that also sort of goes to this question. Um, so somebody is interested in applying in uh, for Persian CLS. They are currently a sophomore at a community college studying cybersecurity and are, are wondering about how to sort of build these things together. So the first thing I want to do is just echo everything that all of my co-panelists said. So, you know, remember to really be yourself in your application, uh, get as many eyes on your essay as you possibly can, um, as well as taking the time to sort of explore the website and what tips and tricks there are already out there for uh, CLS applicants. Um, another really important thing here that you mentioned is you already have a pretty clear career trajectory, right? Um, and you've got a language decided and a career uh, trajectory decided. So one of the big things that you really want to emphasize in all of your application and your essays is how those things go together, how CLS and how this language skill can help you in your future career in cybersecurity, taking some time to really think about what your future career goals are and how CLS can be built in as a, as a reasonable step to get there, how you will be able to um, take the skills that you've learned so far and implement them in your language learning and how your language learning will help to further develop your future skills for your for your um, intended career. Um, I think that that's a really important way to sort of go about things, but it's also really important when you're thinking about this. I really want to emphasize the fact that it's important to be yourself and to share your own identity. Um, you don't want to spend the entire time in your essay explaining why this language is important, why a certain field is important. Um, our reviewers are aware of why these languages are important. That's why they're helping to support us. So you want to make sure that you're explaining why it's important to you and how you are bringing something new and interesting to the field by, by getting involved. Um, so we don't have any other Q and A's right now, but if anybody is watching and has some questions for any of the panelists, for the alumni, um, please feel free to write into the Q and A. Um, and as I said, that more of them come in. So uh, the next question we have here is, if a student is wanting to prepare for a career requiring backgrounds in multiple languages and cultures within a region, as opposed to a singular, singular language and culture, could that student apply for in different competition cycles for one language under Spark and another under the CLS? So um, the short answer to this is yes. Um, completing the scholarship in one program in one program cycle, so one year, does not preclude you from participating in a scholarship in the future. However, if you have done CLS overseas before, then you are no longer eligible for CLS Spark. So if you do CLS Spark as a beginner for Arabic, Russian, or Chinese in the summer of 2024, then you could still also apply for another CLS language for an abroad program in the summer of 2025. Um, if you are successful in uh, getting a CLS award one time, that does not mean that you are going to get it another time. Um, as you heard here from both of our panelists, it's really competitive and many people do apply multiple years in a row to uh, before they're successfully selected as a finalist for uh, the CLS program. So make sure that you're really considering what language is most important to your career. And in each cycle, you're only able to apply for one language and one program. So you'll have to choose um, if you intend to do CLS Spark, you'll need to apply for CLS Spark. And then the next year, you would be eligible to apply for a different language overseas or the same language overseas with CLS. Thank you, Jay. And one other thing I just wanted to know regarding CLS Spark is that um, if you do get accepted for CLS Spark, let's say for Mandarin, you complete the program and you are uh, an alumni with good standing, uh, you know, finish the program off, and then you apply the next year, you do get automatic semifinalist status for the CLS overseas program, but it has to be for that same CLS Spark language. So if you did Mandarin, then you could go ahead and apply for the overseas program for Mandarin. 
but you could not do CLS Spark for Russian and then take that automatic semi-finalist status and try to apply it, um, you know, for Portuguese. Um, so it does need to be that same language. But of course, we understand that a lot of CLS students are interested in many different languages. So it is possible, um, you know, to do different languages, different years, um, if you do meet the eligibility requirements. Okay, we still have time for a couple more questions if anyone is interested. Oh, I was just going to add very quickly on to the wanting to prepare for a career requiring multiple languages. Um, I, like I mentioned before, like I speak Mandarin and Indonesian and I've utilized both um, sort of in my field of study. Um, and when I was applying, and both are critical languages, so obviously like I was deciding whether or not I wanted to study one or the other and if you're like trying to make the decision I would really like think about sort of the resources available to you um and also like what sort of you can what you can argue for in your essays um because I speak Mandarin at home while like a CLS program in Mandarin would really help me um I felt that like me personally like Indonesian was a much stronger option because I felt that I would have less opportunities to study it in the States. So I think that's just like a consideration um, if you're uh, thinking about studying multiple critical languages or multiple languages in a region, yeah. Um, so we have another question that's come into the Q&A. Um, it was mentioned how we should feel comfortable to share our identities in our essays. Would it be better to explain this in the citizen diplomacy section, commenting on how I can bring my queer identity to represent America, or how will I exceed in a challenging environment because I've already dealt with experiences where I am different from others? Um, so I'll let any of my panelists take a, a first stab at how to, how to approach this. But I think the first thing to question and to ask yourself is where you think it fits in best. Um, I think you know, you've uh, definitely illustrated how it can fit into citizen diplomacy and how it can fit into um, demonstrating resilience abroad. Um, and both of those are great ways to sort of highlight and showcase um, how your past experiences will impact your CLS uh, experience if you're selected as a finalist. Um, so I think that that's, you know, you're asking the right questions and you're presenting it in the right way to begin with. Um, yeah, I can also add to this. Um... <laughs> Yeah, I would agree with what Jay said and also, um, yeah, like mention it. If you think it's appropriate, mention it in both, mention it in one or the other or mention it in either. Um, but from my experience, um, if I remember correctly, I um, mentioned it in both essays because I personally um, thought it was important and something unique that, um, you know, I could bring to in terms of citizen di diplomacy yeah, and also a way that I had um, dealt with a challenging um, environment before. So yeah, it's completely um, up to you. And also there's a question of um, space. I think that's the biggest thing with the essays is like, there's a lot you can say, but what do you want to say in that limited amount of space? So like, maybe you don't want to talk about your queer identity in every single essay. And when you want to choose the one that like makes the most sense, simply because of a space issue, not because it's not important, right? Um, so yeah, that's my recommendation. Great advice, Jay and Derek. So I think at this time, it looks like we're through all of the questions. I just want to thank Derek and you may so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to share your insights, your tips, and your experiences. Um, and I just want to remind everyone, if you are interested in applying for CLS, there is still time to put together a strong application, but you should start soon because the application is coming up um, due on Tuesday, November 14th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And this is not a deadline that you want to submit, you know, just one hour before you want to submit early to make sure there's no computer glitches that you have your responses in. Um, so do get started soon. Reach out to peers, professors, resources on your campus. Check out our website for more program information. Um, and we're really here to support you. If you have any further questions, um, you can always reach out to our email address um, or call us 
um, or again, look at our resources on our website. So we really encourage you to apply. We're excited to see your applications. I um, just want to thank everyone again for being here. So thank you so much.